Welcome back. I'm Dan Handelman, and this is part two of the Flying Focus Video Collective's Bussiversary, our annual look back at shows we produced for the weekly video bus. And I'm PC Perry. Unlike a lot of TV, Flying Focus prioritizes making a better planet over serving corporate profits. Some of the issues we cover include peace, police accountability, economic justice, the environment. Over the years, we've built up a catalog of over 900 programs with hard-to-find speakers, forums, protests, and interviews. This show marks 27 years since the video bus premiered in November 1991. At Flying Focus, content trumps high production values. We want our shows to look good and sound good, but most of all, we want to share the information with the public. If you want to get with us, join, write down this contact information, our phone numbers are 503-321-5051 and 503-239-7456. And our email is ffvc at flyingfocus.org. Contact us to be a volunteer with and or a supporter of Flying Focus. Let's get back to the producers introducing clips from shows produced between November 2017 and October 2018 here on the bus anniversary. The third show I'd like to share with you from this past year is from a panel discussion that I helped organize with another group, Peace and Justice Works. Held shortly after the 16th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan in 2017, it featured five speakers talking about current wars in seven countries, possible new wars the U.S. may be entering in Korea, Iran, and Russia, and the street wars taking place with right-wing groups provoking physical fights and police adding a layer of state-sponsored violence. PC taped the show, and I'm really grateful because not as many people came to see it in person as we had hoped. Not only were we able to cable cast the important information about U.S. foreign policy and how it's reflected in these local skirmishes, but the show is also currently streaming online at youtube.com slash flying focus shows. You may recognize the first speaker here. Uh, as one of the organizers of this event, I gave myself the formidable task of covering seven current U.S. wars in 10 minutes. I'll try to address them one at a time, but there is some overlap. Many people label the war in Afghanistan as the longest war in U.S. history at 16 years this month. We'd argue the U.S. war in Iraq, which started in 1991, never really ended, and has been going on for 26 years. And the Korean War, uh, which ended in an armistice and not a peace treaty, in theory that war is now 67 years old and still running. So why doesn't the U.S. do this? Why does it refuse direct negotiations and risk war? The reason is that there are powerful forces opposing a de-escalation of tensions. Sadly, the tension is useful to the military-industrial complex, which needs enemies to support the ongoing buildup of the military budget. The tension also allows the U.S. military to main troops on the Asian mainland and in Japan. They are planning to somehow provide that buffer zone on the north. Why? Because then it connects, basically. It, it brings Israel to become a neighbor of Islamic Republic of Iran, similarly to the Hezbollah in Lebanon that is now a neighbor of Israel. So these are basically tick for, tick for toll, and uh, the, the situation is getting tougher and tougher. For the last 20 years, there's been an ongoing campaign to expand the boundaries of NATO to the point that it now includes 25 countries and it's literally surrounding the borders of Russia. Can anyone doubt that if the situation was reversed and Russia was conducting regime change operations in Canada or Mexico and building a military alliance around U.S. borders that it would be tolerated? But that is precisely what is happening all around Russia and particularly in the Middle East where what started with Afghanistan and Iraq is now morphing into Libya and Syria. Now, I have to explain this because People like me and people of color and other target groups cannot afford to pretend that a public appearance by murderers is just a free speech event. Free speech, I think we'll agree, is the exchange of ideas between approximate equals or at least between people who are not threatening each other. Meta statements, threatening murder and dismemberment are not. And that's what you get with the Klan and the Nazis and the alt-right. Another show that looked at U.S. foreign policy featured a panel discussion on the Iran nuclear agreement which President Trump decided to abandon in May. The June Forum was coordinated by the American Iranian Friendship Council. It features two national speakers, Jamal Abdi from the National Iranian American Council and Reese Ehrlich, an independent journalist who has reported extensively from the region. Two local speakers who have traveled to Iran talked respectively about visiting as a member of the Peace Corps and about the dangers of nuclear weapons in general. The event, as well as our show, was dedicated to the memory of Anne and Bruce Huntwork, 
who appeared as guests on one of our earliest shows and variously through the years. They both died in the year prior to the forum and were great advocates for peace with Iran. Over the years, since 2009, I've seen, you know, sort of the best and the worst. Uh, I saw the, you know, this administration, this president, you know, Barack Obama, who in many ways, you know, inspired me along my political journey. This president, who I admired so much, decided to impose crippling sanctions on Iran. And, uh, you know, according to the administration, I think with, with good intentions, they said, well, this is about building leverage and, you know, this is, there is a diplomatic off-ramp. Uh, but, you know, uh, to many of us and to many of the people who were supporting the sanctions, this was actually about not punishing the Iranian government, but punishing the Iranian people. But they're also having very real negative impacts on uh, Trump. So, for example, he's keeping the troops in, in, in Afghanistan. The U.S., I don't know if this comes as a shock to you folks, but the U.S. has lost the war in Afghanistan. And <laughs> you can tell that when your capital city is constantly subject to enemy attack. And the only way your troops can get around in the capital city that you're supposed to control is by helping. That means you're losing the war. Uh, the uh, trade war that now the Europeans and the Chinese are standing up to Trump's uh, <laughs> protectionist policies, and it's having consequences. One o'clock in the morning, I came face to face with a very angry congressman on a bill that he was not happy about, but it was the last day of Congress, and I had to convince him to let it go through. And uh, but he was angry about it, and we had to work it out. And as I was sit sitting there thinking about it, I thought, you know, this isn't good. Jack Brooks is a pretty mean guy, but, you know, I was once dropped off in a village in Iran, not knowing Farsi, and, uh, and sat managed to survive that. So maybe I'll survive this as well. Then we need to cancel the plan that was started with President Obama to replace our entire nuclear arsenal at the tune of billions of dollars. We need to work together uh, with some of the other bills that um, are in the uh, Congress to demand no attacks on Iran. And I'm heartened that the House did pass that resolution um, saying that the President shall have no authority to start a war with Iran. One topic I come back to a lot is police accountability. This year, we covered a forum put on by Peace and Justice Works project group Portland Cop Watch and a number of other groups to bring the community up to speed on Portland police participation in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We've been covering this issue since 2001. A few weeks before 9-11, we aired a show about police cooperating with the FBI and the secretive group. The main speaker was Michael German, a former FBI agent who tried to blow the whistle on unethical conduct, then resigned and joined groups working for civil liberties. Also on the panel were members of the ACLU, the Japanese American Citizens League, and the Council on American Islamic Relations. Plus, Brandon Mayfield, a local attorney who was wrongly accused of terrorism based on improper surveillance and a bogus fingerprint match. So following that research in 2005, the Portland City Council finally heard our, our concerns and withdrew from fo formally participating in the JTTF. And then in 2015, sort of inexplicably, at least inexplicably to me, Portland fully rejoined the JTTF and removed all of the safeguards. Even though those safeguards we know were not really being followed, um, they then just threw them out the window. Um, and that is where we are today. To date, what we have seen from the Muslim community is that there's been several hate crimes that have happened all across the state. And one would assume that you would have JTTF officers involved in these hate crime situations and then the DOJ would bring forth federal hate crime charges. They have not. Since the election of Donald Trump, not a single case has gone to a federal court. That's troubling. The important part is that the same special agent who's at my house reports me departing at 3.19 p.m. and at 3.40 p.m. The task force agent, that's the Portland you know, task force agent, reports me, the subject, standing in front of the Bilal Mosque, the Bel Bilal Mosque in Beaverton, or Oregon. So think about that. The FBI admitted they had no evidence I'd committed a crime, and yet the FBI and task force proceeded to collect information about my religious activities and associations. Our lives were changed forever uh, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, <clears throat> On Sunday morning, on, on, Sunday, on Sunday morning, on December seventh, nineteen forty-one. So by two thirty on that afternoon of, of that uh, day, uh, the FBI swarmed 
uh, over the Japanese neighborhoods and began arresting community leaders. That, that fake bomb actually went off, right? They could hear the boom. So they could have arrested him right then. There was no reason to do this theatrical event in Portland with a fake bomb. That was all for you. That wasn't to arrest him. That was, that was for show. That was to, to create an anxiety within the community that would then justify what the FBI was doing. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, they, they the council, it worked. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it put, put the, the, uh, a, a more participation with the Joint Terrorism Task Force. PC here again. I produced one show this year about the uh, settlement agreement between the U.S. Department of Justice and the city of Portland. The agreement came about because the DOJ found the police used too much force against people, especially people with mental health issues. This was the third show recorded at the mental health conference in 2017. Alva Myers ran the camera and I coached. The panel was made up of Dr. T. Allen Bethel, co-chair of the Albina Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform, and the coalition's two attorneys. They gave a detailed history of the case being filed in the federal court, and the police union joined as a defendant. The coalition signed as a friend of the court, and they talked about ups and downs, including city appealing the case twice and the loss of a community oversight board which was just replaced in 2018 after two years after the 2010 shooting and ending of officer involved shooting that ended in the death of aaron campbell dr haynes and myself we had had a conversation that we've gone as far as we could locally and it was at that point that we could seem to get no district attorney cooperation, no city cooperation, that we then made a statement. I know the city of Portland says we asked for the investigation by the Department of Justice. And yes, they did ask for a criminal investigation into the civil rights in the Aaron Campbell case. They agreed and all our constituents on the hill of Capitol Hill agreed. But it was the AMC at that same press conference at North Precinct as following then Commissioner Dan Salzman that I stated that we are calling for an investigation of patterns and practices into the Portland Police Bureau. What the judge did here was he uh, specifically laid out the um, role that the AMAC would be allowed to play in this case and uh, allowed the AMAC to uh, participate in briefing on all issues in the case, to attend hearings, to attend mediation, to uh, participate in oral arguments to the same extent as the parties. And this is a pretty significant role to give a community organization in a lawsuit. So um, it's, it was no small matter. As he said, the AMAC will have a seat at the table. And um, so that's a, a pretty big deal for the community, and it's something that um, we've been working throughout this process through years to try to um, facilitate more and more of the community engagement and to keep the community engaged because this is a very long and lengthy process. And also relied on the city, who's the defendant in this case, to administer, provide a lot of the administrative support. And that also struck people a lot um, it, as kind of not the appropriate way to handle this the perception was that if this person, if this organization is in collusion with the defendant in this case, they're not going to be somebody that people trust going to and trust with their stories and feeling vulnerable and trying to engage with, with um, th this organization when trying to talk about police reform. Faith and justice is our topic. Barb did the editing and it uh, brings in Pastor Knudsen's church with his guests from D.C. Right, so Pastor Knudsen has a sanctuary church here in town and um, he's in a PhD program and these are a couple of people who are in that program with him. Uh, Kip Banks from Washington DC Church and Joshua Dubois um, who was known as Obama's faith advisor and he wrote a book about his experiences there. And so he has something to say here. There was music in that 
program. Marilyn Keller. Marilyn Keller and the, I think, the Augustana. Ron Steen. Jazz band. Right, the and house band. Yeah, amazing music. It's really worth watching. The enemy, the whatever, could not have designed a more devastating blow to Christian witness in this country than Donald Trump. <laughs> to have people who are branded as the most prominent public Christians support a man who cheated on his third wife with a porn star. I mean, I'm sorry, I know this is a, <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. Um, it's just, you know, the, the hypocrisy of that. And so if you're, you know, a millennial trying to figure out if you want to run towards the church or away from it, or if you're, you know, someone who's really grappling with their faith, um, and you look at this brand of Christianity, and you say, you know, separate from the politics of it, just the pure hypocrisy, or is that a place that you want to find yourself? Of course not. And, and I think it's going to, we're going to look back and see, and I believe God is bigger than all of this, and so he can fix and say <laughs> all of this, but there's a danger that we'll look back and see droves of people ran away from this thing called faith because of the Christian association with Donald Trump. And so there's a perversion of scripture and of values and a hypocrisy there. And then finally, I have to say, um, this is as someone who's you know, pretty progressive my, myself, um, there are a lot of moderate and conservative Republicans who um, don't actually like Trump a whole lot, but the, um, the issue of abortion is so significant for them that they cannot wrap their minds around anyone who, um, who uh, supporting anyone who is pro-choice. And increasingly, unfortunately, I think the Democratic Party, while you know, they should never compromise their principles, hasn't created much of a space for people to feel like they even have a little bit of room for them to stand over there. Um, and they've actually actively pushed people away. And so I think if, um, you know, if the party, for example, talked about supporting women and reducing the number of abortions, even if it would remain legal, but re um, that that would be just enough of a hook for for folks who may you know maybe pro-life Americans to say you know okay I, I can I can deal with that and I'll and I'll I'll be over there with you guys as opposed to with this crazy man. But right now, there's not any space in the, in, on the left um, to to do that. We're going to talk about. Lower Albina, the area around the Rose Quarter, the Moda Center now. Do you remember editing that? I do. It was a very interesting panel. Um, I think a lot of people, especially people who are new here, are not aware of right. how the whole area, which was a thriving community, uh, mostly African Americans, and it was pretty much hijacked for um, purposes that, of the city. And now they're looking at ways to to turn it back to the community and make it into a neighborhood again. Or make money. Mm -hmm. And let's see how um, the death of Paul Allen affects this whole equation. Yeah, that'll be interesting. One of the really interesting points um, or opportunities in this development is for us to have a conversation about monumenting. That as a descendant of, you know, a fourth generation black Oregonian, the Memorial Coliseum for me is a monument of power, of, of white power, the power to destroy the homes of white veterans to build a monument, uh, black veterans to build a monument to white veterans. And it's an opportunity to talk openly about what that means. The building is a really special and important building, but um, unlike the South where, you know, there are Confederate monuments that people are fighting over, just know that your black neighbors are thinking about these buildings that you think of as architectural heritage there's a monumenting issue stewing here too. And we hope that in the process of talking about the vision for Albino, we can uh, squarely face that conversation and heal in the process. We talked for a year before I think we really got down to the real talk. Um, and we decided to focus the vision for Albina um, around six core principles. We wanted to start with values first instead of going straight to the built environment. And that is one of the features that makes this project distinct from other projects. In addition to that, we have a way that we want to manage this vision that's quite different than it has been managed in, in, the, in the past, and Zary will talk a bit more about that. But I want to tell you what those values are. The first is that we want a place to live, work, and play. We want it to be a neighborhood where people can live, 
out their lives and not have it be a destination where people come and go based on events, which is what it is now. I mean, if you're in that neighborhood, you're a pedestrian trying to cross the freeway or cross the street or like, where do you get dinner there before and after the games? It's not a place to live, work, and play. So we want it to be fundamentally a place where people live, live work, and play. You'll see some of these images are just meant to evoke your imagination about how we might do that together. The second is that we want to heal ourselves and our community, communities, um, healing how we've treated each other using urban design as a tool for harming, harming each other, to be frank, and also heal the river. We're going to look at festivals now, having to do with the um, Pan-African Festival on the Bricks at um, Pioneer Courthouse Square, and the other one was at the... Uh, East County Community Rec Center. Right. Um, so there's, this is a, a really fun one. I mean, there's so many topics that we cover are really depressing, but this was, there's some high energy uh, Bollywood dancing. There's a play that was written about new uh, refugees. And um, there's, uh, uh, like you said, some of the Pan-African festivals. So. Dancing, food, and fun. Yeah. Yeah. Great. In the old days, when I lived with your grandmother and your grandfather in the old country, before the men with the guns came and forced us into, the, to, into these camps, they used to say to me, Muhammad, in our homes and in our hearts, all are welcome. You, you remind me a lot of them. I am? Yes, yes, you are. They used to ask the same questions, your grandmother and grandfather, the same questions you are asking me now. They always dreamed of repatriating home from this refugee camp. They wanted a chance to start over and live a new life. But they never got to realize that dream. But we still have a chance. We will overcome this sooner or later. We will be free from this refugee camp. Abia is asleep. Muhammad lies down to sleep too. Lights fade. Scene two, morning. Muhammad is very close to the radio, listening, and Ronnie is cooking. Abia is combing her hair. And in other news, the United States will begin to resettle refugees who have been in the camp for 20 years. More news later today. Papa, are they talking about our camp? Uh, I'm not sure. But it's possible, isn't it? We could be starting a new life. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know that. Even if it is true, we would have to think about what we should do. What is there to think about? If we do not know where we're going, at least it will be another refugee camp. We don't even know if it's our camp. But why if it is our camp? Then we must accept for our daughter. She's never seen anything outside the wall of this hut. We need to accept a new life. Whatever it brings us, Abia will be free. Celebrate the and illuminate the treasures in our diversity. From the vendors that are here with their materials and all of the fashions, from the food vendors to all of the talent that we've seen so far. Hi, I'm Steve Roberts. Earlier, Dan mentioned the loss of Anne and Bruce Hunt work. Volunteer and former professional videographer Ron Webb also passed away. Perhaps our largest loss was associate member April Adams, who helped carry equipment, fold bulk mailing pieces, and kept us fed backstage. We're prepared a short tribute to April, who was too shy to appear on the program, with music she played on the violin. That was a very moving tribute. We all miss April very much. Uh, now we're ready to say goodbye from the 27th bus anniversary. Thanks for watching. We want to educate the community 
so that people can take action to make real social change. To volunteer with or to support Flying Focus in any way, call 503-239-7456 or 503-321-5051. You can also write ffec at flyingfocus.org. The video bus appears every week on cable TV. All of our past bus anniversaries and dozens of our other shows are streaming on the web at flyingfocus.org. Set a video recorder or tune in every week in this same time slot for the Flying Focus video bus. We'll be looking for you next week. You'll see us here.